All right, we'll talk about anger today. So, first of all, the passion of anger. The passion of anger is a passion like all the others, which has been placed in us by God for a good purpose. So, God doesn't create anything for a bad purpose, obviously. So, all the passions are in us for a good purpose. As a passion, it is a violent emotion which arouses our energies to overcome some difficulty. So the object of anger is a, an evil which is difficult to repulse. It is to throw off an evil which is assailing us. We vent our anger upon persons, animals, and things as they all from time to time annoy us and cause us evil. So, when you fall off your bicycle, you kick your bicycle because obviously it was the fault of the bicycle. See, so you, you have a, or anything, you know, the, like a, a horse that won't move fast enough or a, it could be anything like that, little things and big things. The sentiment of anger, as opposed to the passion, consists in a vehement desire to repel and punish an aggressor. So that's the emotion, you might say, of passion, of, of uh, anger, is to have this desire to repel and punish an aggressor. Thus there is a lawful emotion of anger, a righteous indignation, which is the ardent but rational desire to inflict just retribution upon the guilty. So, for example, the civil law must inflict just retribution upon the guilty. And that's why there are courts and jails and electric chairs and various other things. <clears throat> so we see such justified anger in our Lord's expulsion of the money changers from the temple. But there are many, many cases of justified anger. The conditions of justified anger are these. First, it must be just objectively. That is, it must seek to punish only those who deserve punishment. and to punish them according to the proper measure. And not excessively. So, anger requires a great deal of control by reason. So, for example, when a parent is angry with a child for doing something wrong, there has to be a, an enormous amount of control over that anger in order that it be used properly. And when used properly, it's very effective. When it's used improperly, uh, it, 
it causes a lot of damage. So the person has to deserve the punishment. And the punishment must be moderated according to the, the guilt of the person. So as they say, you don't swat a fly with a baseball bat. Second, it, in order that it uh, be just, it must be tempered by moderation in its execution, going no further than the offense demands and adhering to the requirements of justice, which is related to what I just said. That's why it's always better if you ha feel a, a rise in the passion of anger to wait. Very dangerous. It can control you instead of instead of where you control it. Uh, anger can very quickly take over in you, and in almost all cases, you'll do something wrong. Thirdly, in order to be justified, it must be animated by motives of charity. Charity is the, what we might call the operating system of the entire spiritual life. And every single virtue that, and the act of every single virtue must be in accordance with charity. So it cannot be motivated by hatred. Hatred is to wish evil on someone for, uh, obviously a judge wishes, wishes evil on, on a condemned prisoner, but for an unjustified reason. In other words, uh, to uh, hope that somebody dies in order to obtain your, their money. I hope my rich uncle dies soon. I don't have a rich uncle. <laughs> but that would be a form of hatred. I was wishing evil on someone. Distinguish that from the hatred of abomination, which is simply means that you don't like someone because of some sort of peculiarity that they have that is offensive to you. They talk too much. They smell bad. Uh, they, uh, they have a stupid sense of humor. Or uh, That's known as the hatred of abomination. And it's actually justified if there is something truly to object to in your nature, in your neighbor. And that, that uh, it's not a sin at all. As a matter of fact, it, it, it's perfectly normal. But don't let it cross over into the hatred, uh, this type of hatred, I, I forget what they call it exactly, I can't remember, uh, where you wish evil on someone because you have a hatred of abomination. So, you know, if somebody talks too much, you might say, I hope that person drops dead. You know, that would be wrong, obviously. I'm using very, you know, clear examples. <laughs> Hopefully you would never think that. So, so the anger must be motivated by charity, that is, not motivated by hatred, but by a true zeal for the good and order. And for the conversion and amendment of the guilty. If any of these three conditions should be lacking, there is moral guilt in our anger. Y 
Usually, just anger may only be found in those in authority who must reward the good and punish the evil. Usually. However, occasionally, anger can be justified even among equals, since sometimes evildoers cannot be moved by kind words, but only by fear of punishment. But really, any kind of injustice would be the object of anger. Justified anger, any kind of injustice. So if somebody steals something from you, you that would be a justified anger. Now, anger as a vice. As a capital vice, anger is a violent and disordered desire of punishing others. Regardless of the three conditions which I mentioned above. So, anger becomes a sin, and if it's a habit, a vice. If you are... Uh, in the habit of having a violent and disordered movement toward punishing others. Often this anger is accompanied by hatred. Often, not always. Which goes beyond the mere removal of the aggression and seeks revenge. Seeks to inflict evil for evil on the opponent. That's wrong. Only in the case of inflicting evil on a criminal is that correct, I mean, what we call distributive justice. But among equals, you know, I. Uh, you burn my house down, I'm going to go burn your house down. That's not, that's not right. You can be plenty angry that somebody burned your house down. But you can't go burn his house down because he burned your house down. The first movement of anger is impatience. So patience is to bear a wrong. It comes from patsior, to suffer. So the first movement of anger is impatience. This gives rise to a show of temper, which is that passion. From this flows agitation. Then violence. And after that, fury. In other words, violence that is out of control. Anger that is totally out of control. Smashing dishes. And <laughs> screaming and yelling. Anger will degenerate into hatred, which sometimes can go so far as to, the, to desire the death of one's adversary. Now, the malice of anger. When anger is merely a 
passing impulse of passion, it is a venial sin. Now, this is non-justified anger or excessive justified anger. So you can have, you sin either by an unjustified anger or by an excess of anger in a justified cause. So those are the two ways to sin by anger. So if you just have a rise of anger, almost always that is a venial sin. So uh, a wife gets upset with her husband and she says, I, I wish I had never married you. And then she goes into her room and slams the door. That's a venial sin. So most of the arguments between spouses are venial sins. Most, not all. Most. You're a horrible person. I can't stand you. <laughs> These things that are said in anger uh, almost always they're venial sins and you should know that for the confessional. See, when people confess anger, you presume it's a venial sin unless there is some indication that it's mortal. How would it be mortal? Usually, well, by extreme vehemence or if it turns into hatred, wishing evil, some serious evil, uh, and seriously, you see, if a, if a wife says to, your, to her husband, drop dead, all right, she doesn't mean that seriously. So it has to be really intended. And uh, so, or if some grave damage results from the anger, such as, and I know a case like this, where the wife goes out and uh, takes all the air out of the tires of the car. <laughs> I would say that's grave. I mean, especially if you had to go someplace and you know, to, to replace all that. I would say that that's a, a grave sin, at least objectively. See, so sometimes it's like gluttony. Gluttony is almost always a venial sin. It's just when there are a, when there are peracidens, things that happen, grave things that happen as a result of the gluttony, then the gluttony becomes a mortal sin. So if you were to eat all the food in the house right, so that nobody else has anything to eat, that would be a mortal sin. Now, it's rare. There's a lot of food around here. But the, the or, if, you know, some sort of, uh, or if you were to eat yourself into uh, very bad health, you know, where you're 500 pounds or something, you can't get out of bed. You just lie in a bed because there's nothing else to do except vegetate and eat. See, that would be a mortal sin where you're destroying your health or you're doing things that are bad for your health with regard, like if you're a diabetic and you're drinking Coca-Cola the whole day so you are, or things that, are, that you shouldn't be doing. That could be, it could get mortal. So, but anger is the same thing. Almost always in, in practice, it's a venial sin. And you would presume that. You see, there's certain presumptions that you make in the confessional. Like with children, you presume, presume, now presumption always gives way to fact, but you presume that the small children are incapable of mortal sins. They're capable, strictly speaking, but ordinarily they don't commit mortal sins. So uh, that's the presumption. So if they confess something that they don't have enough judgment, because they're little kids, you know, they don't have enough judgment to, to work out the, the malice of mortal sin. Usually, some do. <coughs> so you shouldn't make a blanket rule. 
It's just that that's the presumption. Just as when a person is is of uh, what we call delicate conscience, and you can tell that by the way they're making their confession. That means they they are their conscience is well trained and they're sensitive to sin. If they don't know if they have consented or not, you presume that they have not. On the other hand, if they are of lax conscience, and you can tell by the way they're confessing, then you presume that they did. See, so there's certain presumptions in the confessional. I'm just letting you know that. You'll learn that. <clears throat> so, um, so, so anger is, uh, is venial even in some rather severe losses of temper. So usually the fighting between the spouses is venial, usually. All spouses fight. And it's really not such a bad thing because they're communicating. <laughs> so when they stop communicating, that things start to fall apart. So just let me finish this. Uh, anger can become mortal, however, if our anger has a serious effect, which I said, such as grave insult or serious injury to our neighbor. If such serious outbursts are deliberate, they are mortal sins, but often they are not deliberate and willful. So if you were to have a really serious outburst of anger that you premeditated, that would be a mortal sin. But almost always, it, people lose their tempers. They say horrible things. They, they, you know, they slam doors and kick things and <laughs> say nasty things that they don't mean. <clears throat> and that is, is, in nearly all cases, venial. Because you lose deliberation and anger. And so one of the necessities of mortal sin disappears because you have no... Not insufficient deliberation. <clears throat> that doesn't mean it's good. It's just that it, it avoids mortal sin. So we're talking about anger. And I said that when anger is merely a passing impulse of passion, it is a venial sin. In itself. Uh, this is true even in some severe losses of temper. So when you blow up or lose it, as they say. It can become mortal, however, if our anger has a serious effect, such as grave insult or serious injury to our neighbor. If such serious outbursts are deliberate, they are mortal sins, but often they are not deliberate and willful because of lack of perfection of the act, as we say, lack of sufficient reflection. When anger goes to hatred and rancor, it is, and it is deliberate and willful, it becomes a mortal sin. So if it turns into hatred, which it easily does, that means to wish evil on someone, uh, it becomes a mortal sin. Again, if it is deliberate, but very often that is deliberate. For it is a serious offense against both justice and charity. Our Lord said in St. Matthew, But I say to you that whosoever is angry with his brother shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council, and whoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. If the impulse of hatred, however, is not fully deliberate, 
then the sin would be only venial. That's true of anything that's grave matter. If you have what we call a defect of the act, that means it's not a perfect act, that is, it's not totally deliberate, right? or without full consent of the will, uh, then you, it passes, even grave matter passes into venial. These are general principles of moral theology. So often, you know, a, a spouse might say to, her, to his or her spouse, I hate you. Usually, <laughs> that's, it, it's said in anger. Things said in anger usually are exaggerations uh, and uh, are, are, you know, not meant the way they're said. but they could be. Now, what are the effects of anger? Anger is the cause of many evils in the family and in society. It is responsible for murder, for poisonings, dissensions, civil wars, and wars between nations. It causes a lot of harm. There is nearly always some anger involved in a murder. And often it is the principal cause of the murder. Unless it's something premeditated, for example, you know, killing your grandmother in order to obtain the inheritance. That's all premeditated. That's not based on anger. But uh, many times, you know, people in the, get into arguments with their spouses. <laughs> it's always their spouses. Uh, and will shoot their spouses. That's not uncommon. In anger. Anger is also the cause of severe unhappiness in the family. Whenever someone is angry, there is unhappiness. Whenever there is an outburst of anger, not where anger is properly used, but when it is improperly used, the result is unhappiness, and people just want to get out of the room. They run away. And if there's a constant anger in the home, there's a lot of unhappiness in the home. And that does happen. And some families live in perpetual unhappiness because the husband or wife, mother or father, are perpetually angry, always arguing one with the other. And so the whole house is just filled with anger. It happens. It's not, not uncommon at all. So unhappiness is an effect of anger. Uh, this is excessive, sinful anger we're talking about. Typically, the husband will raise his voice in unjustified and immoderate displays of passion. He'll start yelling. will say cruel things to his wife and children. Really cruel, withering things. He will slam doors, kick things, punch and smash things and sometimes even become violent with the members of his family. Now this should not be confused with the due and proper use of corporal punishment, which is not, should never be done in a fit of anger. So, because you can't, you're not in control when you're in anger, you know, uh, the passion of anger. Typically, the wife will become what we call in English a screaming banshee. 
incessantly criticizing everyone, whining about the work she must do, barking at everyone as they go by. This, this is not uncommon. <laughs> uh, when you hear confessions, you'll hear the anger come up a lot. <laughs> uh, children display their anger by tantrums when they are young, a little child having a tantrum. No, I won't do it. And they stamp their feet. No. And later, through rebellion and murmuring against their elders as they grow up, All of that translates into rebellion as they grow older. What is merely tolerated as, oh, you know, a passing uh, passion or, a, you know, the, the little child is upset, excused as that, grows up into rebellion when they're teenagers. And that's why the, those passions have to be mortified in children. Because they only know their passions. They only know the gratification uh, their pleasures and their passions and they cannot mortify themselves the parents have to mortify them for them this attitude is the cause of the excuse me this anger is the cause of the surly attitude which is often seen in teenagers as they imagine themselves being oppressed by their parents Now, it's possible for parents to oppress their teenagers. It, it, the, a parent, it, it's a very difficult thing to raise a child because you have to uh, know when to uh, let them become more adult. And that depends on the maturity of the child. See, there, if you suppress somebody that, is, that deserves to be, let's say, more free or... or less ruled you can cause trouble you cause resentment and but other some need direction all the way until they're 25 you know so the parent has to it's something like a clutch on a car if you if you keep it down too long you don't go any place if you let it up too fast you stall so there has to be a gradual lessening of the the let's say the, the directions of the parent in order to let the, the the child become an adult so that's a difficult thing it's it's not easy to be a good parent there's a balance The vice of anger also blocks our spiritual progress for it makes us lose first good judgment you never make a good judgment in anger <laughs> if you do it's by accident it's where your anger is in control you're you're bound to your intellect is no longer in control it's like a, a drunkard driving a car if he doesn't have an accident it's it's by accident <laughs> He should drive into a tree or, or go off a cliff, you see. When anger gets into the driver's seat, anything can happen. So we lose our good judgment. Secondly, we lose our gentleness, which is the soul of all good social relationships. Gentleness. Being uh, nice, uh, being uh, courteous, polite, and... That's the basis of all good social relationships, even those that we have with perfect strangers, people that we see in the supermarket or our next door neighbors. If that gentleness is not there, then everything is disturbed. That's why you say thank you. That's why you, uh, you, you just general politeness is removed by a uh, vice of anger. Third, we lose a sense of justice for anger blinds us to the rights of others. 
See, anger is, is defensive of your own rights. And it is properly used if, you are use, if your rights are true and if you're using it in moderation. But very easily, it, excessive anger blinds us to the rights of others. In questions of justice, if you ever want to know what the answer is to any kind of question of justice, what money you owe or question of rights, reverse it. What if you were on the other side? What would you say? And you always get the answer because then you're looking at it from the rights of the other person. Now, you might come out with the same answer that you had before, but it always gives you perspective. If you were the wronged party or if you, if you were the creditor and you, you, you switched creditor and debtor, you always come out with the right answer. So and that's true. In the confessional, sometimes you have to make these decisions about um, like insurance. A big thing that comes up in confession is, is insurance fraud. And people worry about, you know, because sometimes there's a gray area. Uh, and uh, so then you reverse it and see what happens. If you were the insurance company, what would you say? Not necessarily that they're, it, it just, what, how would they argue? And you'll get a clearer picture of it. Now, with all insurance, by the way, just this is moral theology, it's all the contract. So whenever there's a, a question of insurance, you know, what you, if you defrauded the insurance company, right, it's all in the contract. So many times you cannot answer because you have to look at the insurance contract. So, um, and fourth, we lose a spirit of recollection because anger destroys our interior peace. So it does a lot of damage. It is a, a vice that needs to be mortified and destroyed. It's rooted in pride. The vice is rooted in pride. Because pride makes you excessively attached to your own rights, to uh, a, an excessive consciousness of how you are wronged. I've been wronged. Humility tells you you're nothing. So it doesn't matter if you've been wronged. If you step on an ant, That's not a big loss with regard to creation or the general order of things that you stepped on an ant. The ant has never committed a sin. So actually, you, the ant is better than you are in that sense. In that sense. So if you consider yourself to be nothing and actually worse than nothing because you've committed sins, well then if you are wronged, is that such a terrible thing? What is a terrible thing is that God be wronged. The spiritual life is going to draw you to that, not a consciousness of your own rights and your, your, what, what, what you deserve or what, your, your whole being is going to be ordered toward God and his rights, his glory, etc. Those are the things that we should be really angry about. But that we are wrong. That's why, you, you know, the, the gospel says you should turn the other cheek and there's many, many uh, indications in the gospel of, of meekness and mildness. Meekness is defined as slowness to anger. But if you see him, it's, it's a, a, 
an examination that you should make of yourself all the time because anger is a... <clears throat> we don't pay attention to it as much as we do lust and the other big things. But it is a, a destructive principle in our spiritual lives. Also, it causes us to have lingering hatreds and, and obsession with past wrongs. Even if they're truly wrongs, we, we become obsessed with them. Uh, St. Alphonsus calls that a tumor mentis, a tumor of the mind. That, oh, you know, somebody did this to me and somebody did this to me and, and I'm, you know, I'm wronged and this was terrible. Maybe it was terrible. But that obsession is not something which is healthy from the spiritual point of view. It springs from pride. You're thinking about yourself. You're important and you should not have been wrong. Maybe you are important. But it's not important that you were wronged. See, and that's for on the personal level. Sometimes if it concerns your state in life, that's a whole other thing. Because then it's not just your person, it's it's something beyond your person. So, you know, that a priest be in some way insulted. Uh needs a different response than, than merely your own person. You see, you have to think of state of life. So, you know, that's a whole different prudence. Because you're representing God in the church. Believe me, plenty of people will insult you. <laughs> Don't think that you're always going to be as welcome as the flowers in May. All right. So, what are the remedies against anger? We're probably at, well, we got a little time. The first is recollection. What stops the flow of passionate anger is recollection of soul. Anger is a passion by which we throw off evil. But the spirituality of Christ is the spirituality of the cross. We should therefore perceive the evils which befall us in the spirit of submission to divine providence and union with Christ on the cross. So it's this opportunity to participate in the passion of Christ. His humility, his, the, the insulting of Christ, spitting in his face, slapping him in the face, beating him. So it, it should be a totally supernaturalized reaction to evils. Our reaction to injustice and injuries to our person will then rise as a sweet-smelling sacrifice of meekness to God. So you turn an injury into a virtue, essentially, into an act of virtue. It's a sign of someone who is very supernatural. This recollection will also produce the wisdom and prudence to determine when a moderated anger should be used to preserve good order. Sometimes a moderated anger should be used to preserve good order. Prudence d directs all that. I think it was Plato, Plato, I think. Prudence is the charioteer and the other three moral virtues are the horses. And, and prudence directs when you, you know, how temperance uh, should be applied and how fortitude should be applied, how justice should be applied. Prudence is the dictator of those things. So especially if you're a superior, sometimes you need to use anger, moderated anger, in order to keep discipline. It's, it's quite common. But moderated anger, so that, you know, it's not like you're slamming doors and screaming at people or anything like that, but, you know, you, that 
if you make a correction, uh, the person should understand that you're not real happy about it. <laughs> so that's moderated anger. And uh, that, that's correct. It would be wrong if you didn't have anger. You saw the quotation from St. Thomas Aquinas in the, in the bulletin. No, you don't read the bulletin. <laughs> How it's a sin not to ha ha have anger under certain circumstances. Go read the bulletin. It's probably still in it. Yes. No. No. No, they, you would never do that. Um, I mean, you could correct, for example, a drunken father who needs to be told perhaps by his son, you know, you need to give it up, but not in anger. It would just be a counsel. So we're talking today about how to overcome anger. Uh, first of all, anger uh, is, as we said, usually a venial sin. But we should never take any venial sin lightly, and especially uh, a vice of venial sin. Uh, it's one thing to fail now and again, because that's virtually, well, it is. It's inevitable. Only our Blessed Lady is completely free from a venial sin and was completely free from venial sin. Uh, so um, um, uh, so it, it, that's true of any habit of venial sin. So part of your recollection should be, and your examination of conscience, is looking for those habits of venial sin. Because venial sin has two bad effects, especially vices of venial sin. Uh, one is the reduction of the fervor of charity. See, it doesn't kill charity, but it reduces its fervor. Just like if you think of a fire that is a, a blazing forest fire, or a fire in a fireplace that is just a few hot embers. See, it, it brings down the, the intensity of charity, the fervor of charity. See, so, and that's not good. Secondly, it prepares you for mortal sin. So little by little you give in to these sins deliberately, without any contrition or compunction, you just, well, that's, that's me, you know, I, I do this. That paves the way for mortal sin. Mortal sin becomes easy. And typically people with vices, uh, you know, deliberate vices of venial sin, where they're com complacent with their vices of venial sin, will eventually commit a mortal sin. So we talked about recollection as one of the, uh, yesterday, as one of the ways in which to overcome um, the passion of vice. Remember that the spirituality of Christ is the spirituality of the cross. So the problems and contradictions that come to you during the day, the insults, the uh, all sorts of nasty things that happen to you during the day, should be seen as opportunities to bear the cross and to offer up as sacrifice those either big things or little things. Most of the time they're little things that go wrong, that make you angry, impatient, which is twin sister of anger. It's the beginning of anger. Because impatience is, is the result of receiving some sort of evil. 
and anger wants to throw it off. So impatience is already the first movement toward anger. Anger wants to push it off. The second thing the second way to overcome anger is by humility people who are given to anger are almost always prideful anger is nearly always if not always a sign of pride when I say anger I mean a vice of anger people who are given to outbursts of anger you know where something will set them off and they start yelling and screaming and banging things you know people who are 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 given to anger are also prideful it's a sign of pride and it's something to know for the spiritual life you know and you're a priest you have to be able to diagnose people's spiritual problems It's very much, a, of all the things you learn, one of the most practical is the ascetical theology, which you'll do next year. One of the most practical. It's not necessarily the most important because it's based all on the, on the other theologies. But that ascetical theology you use a great deal in dealing with souls. All of those principles. You'll see them next year. <clears throat> In the first place, their pride makes them excessively sensitive about themselves and about how others treat them. That's known as the pride of sensitivity. It's a form of pride to be excessively sensitive. What people think of you, how people treat you. Did they say hello to you today? Let's see. Or did they look at you the wrong way? See, so people who are ex excessively sensitive are showing a symptom of pride. I'm not talking to him because he passed me in the hallway without saying hello. <laughs> that's... That, that's uh, excessive sensitivity women tend to be more in that vein than men usually you know it, it, that the, the the pride of sensitivity is more of a female thing than a male thing men generally are not sensitive but the, sometimes they are and they're sensitive about things different from what women are sensitive about So for this reason, these hypersensitive people are moved to anger for false reasons. So already their anger is a sin. Secondly, their pride seeks only their own good and despises the good of those around them. That's a general rule of pride. Me first. Consequently, he takes no account that his outburst of anger makes life miserable for his family and for anybody around him. He has to vent. And if everyone is made miserable, that's too bad because he has to vent. It's pride. Could be f friends or co-workers. They don't care about anything else except venting their temper tantrum. The humble person, on the other hand, cares little about himself and therefore bears patiently the wrongs done to him. Like St. Thomas Aquinas, who was scolded by the brother 
for not walking fast enough. Didn't say a word. I always feel sorry for people who yell at saints. And you know, you read the lives of the saints, or who are mean to saints. They go down in history in a very, very bad light, like the novice mistress of St. Bernadette, who thought her to be a fake. Not only a fake with regard to the apparition, but also a fake with regard to her leg problem. She had a, an infection in her leg which made her sluggish in what she had to do. And so she thought she was faking that too. And she wouldn't believe in the apparition. And then she fell ill, and the order put her in a hospital, in a hospital room that faced the grotto. So she looked out her window and saw the grotto every day. Finally, she invoked Our Lady of Lourdes on her deathbed. But I feel sorry for those people that, that <laughs> treat saints badly, but... The saints take it very nicely, and they're there in order to prove the virtue of the saint. Uh, the humble man further has a care for the well-being of his neighbor and is restrained from putting on a show of ugliness. So he has a horror of disturbing his neighbor because he's humble. So he controls his anger. The third remedy is prayer, which is a remedy to everything. We must daily pray to overcome our bad habits and every day make resolutions to avoid them. So you know your bad habits. You know them from what you're confessing and from your examination of conscience. Supernatural virtues cannot be acquired by natural means. So <clears throat> you have to pray for supernatural virtues. They cannot be acquired by natural means. Then number four, Remedy number four is meekness. Meekness is defined as slowness to anger. We should practice forgiveness of enemies by repeating the words of our Lord. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So we say that every single day, many times a day, every time you start the office. On a ferial day in Lent, you say the Our Father four times in prime. You can count them as you can do it. <laughs> um, and then we should think of the forgiveness of enemies which the Sacred Heart practiced on the cross. And you should consider your own list of sins against God. So who are we to get angry at others when God has plenty of reason to be angry with us? Furthermore, give in to others in everything which is lawful. So never impose your own will. Unless you have some reason to, so, you know, where, where some, something requires you to, especially a superior or something like that. But try to avoid imposing your own will. Try to do the will of others, even in little things. That pertains to humility. Don't be constantly imposing your own will.
This does not mean that we should, in a cowardly manner, remain silent when falsehood is being spread or practiced, or where there is some good reason to speak up. Because man is just as deformed in his cowardice as he is in his anger. It simply means that in the everyday course of life, in the insignificant choices and preferences which, we, which must be made, we should yield to the will of others. We should not contradict others unless it is our duty to the truth. And even in this case, the contradiction or correction should be made in all possible mildness and without attacking your opponent's person. So that control of anger is very important when you're a superior. Superiors can do a lot of damage by being angry. Your correction should be always in control. It was said of St. Dominic that whenever he corrected anybody, at the end, both were smiling. So you have to, that's it's one of the you know, qualities of a superior is that he's in control of himself. <clears throat> and then you have some uh, great quotes from sacred scripture. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 16, a fool immediately showeth his anger but he that dissembleth injuries is wise. In Ecclesiastes chapter eight, 7, verse 10, Be not quickly angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of a fool. In Ecclesiasticus, don't confuse those. Chapter 27, verse 33. Anger and fury are both of them abominable, and the sinful man shall be subject to them. And Ecclesiasticus, chapter 30, verse 26. Envy and anger shorten a man's days and pensiveness shall bring old age before the time. And it's true, anger makes the blood vessels around your heart constrict. I don't know if you know that. It does bring on heart attacks. <laughs> That's why people have heart attacks when they get angry. It constricts the heart, uh, blood vessels around the heart. Job chapter uh, 36, verse 18. Therefore, let not anger overcome thee to oppress any man. In Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 10, remove anger from thy heart and put away evil from thy flesh. In Ecclesiasticus chapter 4, verse 35, be not as a lion in thy house, terrifying them of thy household, 
and oppressing them that are under thee. And St. James chapter 1, verse 19, Let every man be swift to hear, but slow to speak and slow to anger. And then St. Paul says that the sun should not set on your anger. I don't have the reference for that. So, don't be angry. All right.